Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. Like I mentioned prior to the break, we are going to be moving off of the NBA draft for some time as the playoffs continue here. But considering that we just had the lottery take place on Sunday, I want to sort of give my thoughts on some of the best fits for the top NBA prospects headed into this upcoming draft where this is, of course, a draft that, like we've talked about, and it's been talked about immensely, does not have necessarily superstar talent at the top. A lot of people are comparing it to 2013, where Anthony Bennett ended up being the number one overall pick, and really the top, all of the top picks really weren't ever necessarily, you know, great players uh, to some degree. I know Victor Oladipo had his flash for a bit there, but It does also have me thinking, and to the 2013 comparison, I mean, Giannis ended up being selected in that draft as well, so there could absolutely be sort of a hidden gem here, but I was also sort of thinking about the fact that all of these GMs are talking about it's the worst draft that they've ever seen, and there are going to be players that sort of rise during the process and people probably will feel better about but I do also wonder to some degree if this has to do with GMs almost trying to proactively protect their jobs saying well this is a terrible draft class so if we don't hit it's not our fault it's the talent that's in the class again just something that sort of popped in my head as I was thinking about this uh, situation surrounding the upcoming NBA draft but Without further ado here, again, I think there are some players who can absolutely contribute to teams, be good role players, maybe be that, you know, third player on a championship team with due time. Obviously, it's going to take a lot of time for that to actually fully play out. But the Atlanta Hawks, as we talked about at length yesterday, have the number one overall pick, and for them... I think that all cards are on the table for them in terms of the different types of directions that they can go in with this upcoming number one pick. I feel like they're probably going to go with Alex Saar, which I I have mentioned before. I love Nyeka Kongwu. He was the sixth overall pick. I want to say it was 2021, and I do still believe in him, but it feels like Atlanta sort of fumbled their chance to have him develop into a franchise center because... They refused to move off of Clint Capella, who I believe was sort of a you know mistake for them. And I understand that Capella isn't a bad player, but I feel like a Kongwu could have provided more. And now if he is going to thrive somewhere, I don't know if I necessarily see it be in Atlanta. Alex Saris, who a lot of people are expecting to go number one, now there are still all kinds of different options because of the fact that there isn't a consensus superstar in this draft, but I feel like it would make a lot of sense to see Sar end up in Atlanta. The Wizards have the number two overall pick. When you ultimately look at their building blocks, there isn't a ton to go off of. Now, Denny Avdia, I thought, had a very under-the-radar season this past year and is somebody I feel like would be worth sort of building around. He, we've known that he's been a very good defender for the uh, beginning of his NBA career, but last year he scored a he showed a scoring potential that is at a different level um, than what we were expecting before. So it's pretty much just him in terms of you know long term assets. So I feel like they can go in all different types of directions here. I feel like this wouldn't be a bad landing spot for Rob Dillingham played this past season at Kentucky and I know that it would probably be a little bit you know if you are a Rob Dillingham fan this would be probably a little bit of a disappointing landing spot and again I want to reiterate this isn't a mock draft but just in terms of what types of players could fit into these situations I think that Dillingham has a lot to improve on in terms of necessarily operating a team of his own. He came off the bench for Kentucky this past season, and I do think that he has that high-end potential. He does, and I obviously there is the Kentucky comparison, but he does rem- remind me in a lot of ways 
of Tyrese Maxey when he was coming out. Now some of the bad habits, I wouldn't even say bad habits necessarily, but shot selection can be a thing. Maybe he just hasn't had the experience with being a true playmaker, but I feel like this would be a situation where Dillingham could walk into the league and sort of showcase what he has while also finding his way, maybe playing alongside Tyus Jones so he doesn't have to be the number one ball handler. Tyus Jones is probably going to be traded sometime, I would imagine, around the trade deadline of the upcoming season. But, you know, he can learn to play off the ball a little bit, but also we can start to find out whether or not he has, you know, true number one ball handling capabilities in his upcoming career. Number three is the Houston or the Houston Rockets. And this is a very interesting spot. Obviously Jalen Green is somebody that a lot of people were ready to turn the page on, but then especially once Alperen Shengun went out for that final stretch of the season, he took over and showed the type of, you know, scoring output he can put together. Some of the defensive efforts that he made were a much improved from what we've seen for the most part in his career and he was really balling out there for a bit, but it's him, Shengun, Jabari Smith Jr. The Rockets went out and invested into some other players as well during the offseason, giving probably, you know, over expensive contracts, but I think in a strategic way where Rockets, they weren't going to attract any free agents anyways, so they went out and overpaid a little bit for Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks. The Rockets are a team that is sort of, you know, on the cusp of contending, and again, in this spot at number three, I don't know how much full-blown upside you're going to get. I would really like to see Dalton Connect, I think, fall in this spot. Somebody who is more experienced from a college perspective. He can give you scoring. We saw his defense improve throughout the year, and I feel like he could be you know, a day-one contributor to help maybe at least swing the pendulum a little bit in favor of the Rockets being able to to contend in the upcoming season now we'll see the west is still extremely deep maybe they do want to go with somebody who has a little bit more long-term upside i could see stefan castle maybe being somebody that could fit into this spot as well kind of up in the air in terms of what he is going to fit in the nba as it seemed like he ran a lot of the point guard position um, alongside Tristan Newton at UConn this past year, but he could perhaps be a wing in the league as well, but at least have some, you know, point forward type tendencies. And this may be a spot where the expectations are low in terms of him, you know, doing a lot of the heavy lifting for an offense, but some of the supplemental stuff, a, a phenomenal rebounder, at least at the college level, for his size the defensive intensity was always there for him he was bought into that UConn system and was a big part of why they won the championship this past year so again feel like Houston probably wants to go a little bit more on the being able to impact on day one player and I think that both of them could sort of fit into that role now San Antonio is a very interesting situation here they have the number four and number eight picks and it seems like they're probably going to i would say double dip a little bit in terms of maybe trying to get a safer prospect that can help slide into the system in san antonio help victor Wembanyama continue in his development maybe have somebody to relieve a little bit of pressure from devin vassell who had to do a lot of the sort of number one option responsibilities last year. And I like Devin Vassell a lot. I believe in him long term, but I don't see him as a point guard. I think that he is somebody who can be really well, uh, be really effective playing off the ball as well. So in terms of, you know, the top playmakers in this draft, like if Rob Dillingham were available here, again, there's a little bit of risk there which is maybe when I talk about the idea of having somebody a little bit more solidified and somebody who can be, 
you know, have a little bit of a higher ceiling. Maybe that's where they swing with Dillingham. Isaiah Collier out of USC is another player that I talked about as well. Super high motor, does have point guard instincts, a little bit raw, but he can be a playmaker as well. I think that the, you know, high paced game that he could play with some of those young bucks in San Antonio could definitely be a fit as well. Now, the the number one player that I do think could sort of work in here as well, but in terms of my favorite fits, I would love to see Reed Shepard end up in Detroit. I feel like that would be the best possible landing spot for him. It is definitely possible that San Antonio could take him, that maybe even Houston could take him, and I wouldn't disagree with either one of those types of uh, landing spots for either one of them, but I think that... I think Shepard would be perfect for Detroit. The fact that we talked about this before, he is sort of prototypically a two guard, but with a point guard size. And he did show that coming off of the the bench, he had probably more playmaking skills than was anticipated coming into college. What he's known for is the three point shooting. And I feel like that hint, that potential of being able to be a number one ball handler, but also knowing that he can contribute off the ball as well, would be such a nice fit for Detroit where you look at the building blocks that they have in Jaden Ivey as their two guard, a little bit more questions with him, but I, I personally believe in, maybe I'm a sucker for the uh, his college career, I was a big fan of him when he was at Purdue. But him, Cade Cunningham, who is a point forward, he runs a lot of the point guard for them. But I think that specifically throwing Shepard in with Cade Cunningham would be the perfect balance of having multiple players who can create for others. Then you throw in Jaden Ivey as well, who can create for himself more so, can be a little bit of an off-ball option I would love to see him end up there. Unfortunate, of course, for Detroit that for the second consecutive season, they finish with the worst record in the league and fall to the fifth overall spot. But I do feel like that would be probably my favorite landing spot. And again, Stefan Castle is somebody who I feel like in that same sense. Now, he doesn't have necessarily the shooting. I think that Detroit needs a little bit more help on offense from a you know, spacing perspective, but Castle is somebody I feel like could probably work in that role. Maybe a, a point guard that is a little bit more of a secondary ball handler as they continue to develop once they reach the NBA. But we're going to be doing tons more NBA draft topics as it comes along. I personally love the NBA draft. I know that the reputation around this year's draft isn't necessarily great, but I still think that it's going to be a lot of fun to get into. But we're going to probably leave it off there for now. And again, as the offseason progresses, we're going to be diving more and more into the draft. But let me know what your sort of ideal fits for a lot of these prospects would be. We are going to now be taking our next break. And when we come back on the other side, we do have the NBA Combine that is tied into the draft that is currently going on, has been going on the past couple days. So we have some storylines to get into there. Bronny James sounds like he's going to be sticking in the NBA draft. So again, whole lot to get into there. Stick with us and we will be right back after this short break. <laughs> 